You're welcome. Welcome back to our summit. I'm Beth Jenley, your host, and I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Arthur Ciara McCauley, who is now in private practice and has been treating clients for more than 30 years. He has a very impressive resume. Previously, Dr. Ciara McCauley was on the faculty of Harvard Medical School for several years, lecturer for the American Cancer Society, chief psychologist at Metro West Medical Center, and director of the Metro West Counseling Center and of the Alternative Medicine Division of Metro West Wellness Center in Framingham, Massachusetts. Dr. Ciara McCauley has appeared on CNN, Good Morning America Weekend, and many other shows. He's been a weekly radio guest on Your Healthy Family, on Sirius Satellite Radio, and Holistic Health Today, and has been interviewed on more than two dozen other radio programs. Dr. Ciara McCauley is the author of several books, his most recent book is The Stress Solution, which is a big reason why we want to be speaking with you today. Welcome to the program, Dr. Ciara McCauley. Oh, thank you very much, Beth. Thank you. So I understand that one of your uh, particular interests is looking at how empathy can reduce our stress levels. How does that work? Well, one of the things that we've learned in recent years, Beth, is that when we give and receive empathy, we produce the near miracle neurotransmitter oxytocin. And you know from being a mother that oxytocin is produced during your pregnancy. But oxytocin also, when we give and receive empathy, it reduces inflammation, it increases generosity, it increases trust. It's called the love hormone, the connecting hormone. When we're stressed, we produce cortisol which in cortisol, when it's, when it's produced in abundance, actually reduces empathy, reduces the camera screen from a large lens camera to a very narrow lens, and produces obsessive thinking, negative thinking, anxiety. It can even produce depression, and it depletes neurons. It actually eliminates neurons in the memory center of the brain. So we know that the giving of, and receiving of empathy is very healthy, on a neurochemical level and an overall physiological level. That's amazing. So what is empathy? Empathy is the capacity to understand and respond to unique experiences of another. It's not sympathy. Sympathy rushes in to console, but empathy is very fact-oriented, very objective-oriented. So it, is a, it kind of slows down a process so that you can truly understand a person beyond the surface. It really looks into the heart and soul of another person. It's in, every, in, in many ways everyday mind reading. It, it's an assessment tool. It allows us to know who to get close to and who to remain distant from. And it's part of our genetic endowment. You know, we're all born with the empathy, the capacity for empathy. But if we don't practice it and we're not disciplined to use it on a regular basis, it atrophies like an unused muscle. Goodness. So how do we practice empathy? What, what are some practical examples of how I might build up that empathy muscle? Well, one of the things that's very important is to slow down. You know, fast reactors, quick reactors usually have limited amounts of empathy because they're reading in immediately based on past conditioning as to what, who you are, what you're saying, what they believe. For instance, you frown and I automatically think you're angry with me. And then I find out later when I slow down that you have a migraine and you're not angry with me. So, but if you had, you grew up with angry parents or you just got, you just got through a divorce where someone was continually belittling you in an angry fashion, you might be reading in very quickly. So empathy doesn't do that. Empathy teaches us to slow down, take in feedback, don't be defensive and don't react quickly. Let the story unfold so that you can really understand where a person is coming from, what truly is their meaning. You're uh, making me think that the, that the companion skill is curiosity. You know, that's an excellent point because curiosity would allow us to ask open-ended questions and that's another aspect of empathy. When people know we're generally curious, and that's why it's such an important point, and we ask an open-ended question, it means we really want to understand the other person. But unfortunately, you know, many questions are really statements. It's sort of like the mother who says to her daughter when after she comes, you know, she introduces her to a new boy that she's having a date with, and then she comes home and she says, well, how do you think your date went? Um, do you really think he's cute? Um, well, she's not, she's not saying, what she's really saying is, I think he's not cute, and I may not approve. 
an open-ended question would be, how did it go? What was your experience like? I truly want to know rather than I've already concluded. When mm. people know that you've concluded, and a lot of times we don't have the courage to ask an open-ended question, we make statements. When we, make, we ask questions when we're really making statements, and people sense that, and so they shut down. So asking a question that, that can't be answered with a yes or no, and asking a question that doesn't project or, or lay our interpretation of the situation. Yes, yes. Is, is far more helpful, it sounds yes. like. Coming from a position of not knowing to knowing. I want to know, but I'm not, I'm not assuming that I know. Uh-huh. And we make, we make all these judgments very quickly because we grow up with certain biases about ourselves and others. We might have a certain bias about somebody from the South or the Midwest or someone of this religion or that religion or this race or that race, or they come from this country or that country. Empathy is a humble, is very much a humble love because it really teaches us that human beings are more alike than they are dissimilar. So we don't judge people by what the way they look or their status, we get to know their character. And that's where true love comes in because when we really love someone on a deeper level, we love the essence of who they are, not just what they look like or what they've achieved. I, I'm thinking that the audience for this summit are particularly successful people, ambitious people, smart people, and one of the, the characteristics that I've noticed in dealing with such people is that we think we're right. We mm -hmm. have interpretations mm -hmm. of situations and we often are right. And mm -hmm. it's kind of tempting to believe we're always right. So what's mm -hmm. your suggestion? If I walk into a situation and you're frowning and I know you well enough to make up a story in my head about why you're frowning, Yes. I think I know. What's your suggestion for how I can back away from that almost arrogance, I would say, unintentional, but arrogance? By trying to be open-minded. I notice that you're frowning, Beth. Mm. I notice that you're frowning. I'm inviting you to tell me what the frown means. Ah, okay. I'm not saying, why the hell are you frowning as soon as I walk in the door? I'm saying, I notice that you're frowning. Mm-hmm. So that's not even a question, really. That's just a statement of fact. I, I a statement of fact. You are frowning. I notice that you're tearing. I don't know what it means that you're tearing. Mm. And I'm asking. I notice that you're tearing. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Which, which implies that I want to know. And I haven't concluded anything. I have no idea why you're tearing or why you're frowning. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay. So when, what if the story is about ourselves? What if I think you're frowning because I know I'm fill in the blank, a bad person, a, I made a bad mistake, whatever, whatever negative story I'm, I'm feeling today? Well, you know, I, what I try to teach people is that we all grow up with, with a novel in our minds. We write a story early in life about who we think we are based on how we're responded to early in life. But it's a novel. It's, it's, and we need to change it into a nonfiction book. We need to get feedback from people we believe are rational and reasonable and get a consensus opinion. That's why I love the format of groups because it's very hard to say if, if 10 people in a group tell you you're such and such, it's pretty hard to deny that, positively or negatively. And you know, a lot of people grow up and they're, they're looking into a mirror, like the mirror of their parents or their coaches or their teachers. And they're trying to see who they are. And we see that all through adolescence. And if you look into a mirror that's cracked, you get a cracked reflection of who you are. So you believe it. I've seen so many people in my career who think they're not intelligent, not attractive, or, or not athletic, or they have no singing voice, or, and so forth and so on. But it's, it's generally not true. And they haven't really even examined it. Because they were taught and told or they perceived that someone thought of them in a certain way. And then it gets encoded in a very deep part of the brain because it's early in life when we truly want to know who we are. And we have to unravel that story. We have to catch ourselves. That's what that negative self-talk does. It's very stressful. And you know, your point about high achievers, high achievers often think because they're very bright 
that they know about the emotional world. And it's a very different aspect of intelligence, as you know. So they think they can think their way through it. You know, I, I call it the psychology of perfection. They think because they can perfect certain things over here, they can perfect the emotional world too. But emotions don't work that way. It's like choosing to love somebody based on their resume. Well, that doesn't tend to work very well. <laughs> but I've got your resume here, so we should be in love, right? What's the problem? And there lies the challenge of dating sites. But that's yes, a whole yes, other topic. Yes. Uh, another way that my thoughts went when you were discussing that and, and the, the beliefs that we develop as we're growing is if prejudice is a part of our growing up or our, our environment, it seems like that would, that would contribute a lot to stress. It, it contributes greatly. And, and as you know, in the book, I was, I was very glad that my publisher allowed me to write a chapter on prejudice because prejudice causes stress. Stress releases the stress hormone cortisol and it limits our capacity for empathy and understanding. So prejudice, when we have a prejudice, it's usually because we're unfamiliar with who we're in contact with. You know, at, at the University of Queensland in Australia did a study where they admitted a, a group of Chinese students and they had two, two groups where they had a lot of the Australian kids work with the Chinese students. And then they had groups where just the Chinese students worked alone and just the Australian students worked alone. And then they did certain tests, psychological tests, to see what their level of prejudice was. Well, the kids who intermingled, the Australian kids and the Chinese kids that worked together on projects, they had very little prejudice. The kids that stayed with their own over time, they tended to remain prejudiced and uncomfortable toward the other. So again, what does empathy do? It allows us to see the common ground, that we're more alike, we're human beings, we're more alike than we are dissimilar, as I mentioned earlier. It's a lack of familiarity or conditioning early in life. You know, I tell several stories in that chapter on prejudice of very educated people who have told me fairly ridiculous things about other cultures or other religions. I don't know, there's a story, in, in, which I think is very poignant, of a, a CEO who told me once, uh, you know, I was in my office and I had the windows open in the summer, and we were talking about a, a time when he had met Jesse Owens, and he, and he heard the dogs bark, and he goes, oh, by the way, you know, dogs don't like black people. I said, really, they don't like black people. I said, uh, how did you decide that? How did you learn that? He said, well, when we were growing up, there was a black family on the corner of our street. And my, my mother always said, don't take the dogs down there. Black, dogs don't like black people. I said, oh, okay. This is a 62-year-old man. You know, and I said, um, by the way, did you ever take the dogs down there? He said, no. I said, have you ever been with a black person with a dog? He said, no. He said, now you're making me feel foolish. I said, I'm not trying to make you feel foolish. I'm just trying to tell you that you're a very bright person. But here was this early, early conditioning. His mother told him, don't go down there with the dogs. Don't talk to these people, which creates the dissimilarity. So I mentioned to him that I have a, a, an African-American uncle, and we call him the dog whisperer, because he's trained our dogs, and dogs seem to love him. And doesn't seem to be any problem whatsoever. He said, he said isn't it amazing? All my success in life, I'm a CEO, I'm a multimillionaire, and I have this ridiculous prejudice. And, and said, and we just stumbled on it. Of course we stumbled on it. It happens all the time. And what I try to emphasize with people is that one of the greatest achievements we can attain in our lifetime is to eliminate the prejudice against ourselves and others. Then we see ourselves truthfully and accurately, and we see others truthfully and accurately. Because whatever I'm denying in myself or whatever bias I have in myself, that blocks my view of you. So I can't see you truly because I have these areas that, that are filled with story that is not based on empathy and objective fact. I, I am I'm bursting with the, the knowledge. I don't know if you know that I was a nurse midwife before I started doing I, what I'm doing I do now. because I, I, I read about your, your very illustrious career on your website. Oh, yes. thank you. You've done so a lot. I still follow some of the obstetric uh, information that's out there. And one of the things that has struck me a great deal in this past year is that they're now pretty sure that prejudice affects, they're, they're seeing 
changes in the survival rate of African American mothers after delivery, their, the risk for mothers and for babies of actually dying after birth in that first year is much higher because specifically of, of prejudice and stress. So it yeah. seems like the, the techniques that you're talking about for how we can center in ourselves and become more curious and open-minded to ourselves and other people maybe we could go so far as to call it life-saving. Oh, yes. And, and oxytocin has been proven to, ex to have the people live longer and they live healthier. I mean, there's so, many, there's so many consequences of having oxytocin in your system. They're really even using it as a nasal spray now for people with addictions. Huh. Using it for fathers who can't bond to children, they take a little spray and they notice that they're, more, they're warmer and more affectionate with their children. And, and one of the things that I think people don't, under, that maybe they understand, but I think it's one of the, the aspects of cortisol, the stress hormone, conversely, that really affects us is we have such problem with weight gain in this country. You know, we have the highest rates of obesity in the civilized world. When you're stressed and you produce cortisol, you throw off insulin blood sugar levels in the body, which enlarges fat cells and makes the brain crave for sugary substances. And in most weight loss programs, I don't hear that being talked about, but it's very important to remember, you know, for listeners to remember that, that when we're stressed, it, it determines what we want to eat. So can we turn that around? That's a really valuable point, I think, to say that when we're stressed, it determines what we want to eat. So let's say I've had just an awful day and I haven't reacted well to it. I'm, I'm about up to here with the stress that's going on and there's cookies in the break room. How do I handle that, those cookies calling to me when I'm stressed? Well, if you, you know, I, I, I think if we don't wind up, we don't, we don't have problems winding down. So we have to be aware of ourselves during the day. How mm. stressed are we becoming? It's taking a little inventory. You know, I see patients on the hour, so I, I have stairs that I go, I run down the stairs, I run up, and then I come run up them again, get a little blood flow to my brain, and I'm, you know, just a little bit of movement helps. But we have to take inventory of what our stress level is. Because a lot of times we get used to it, and, and it's like somebody who sort of lives with a low-level temperature. They don't even know they have one until they don't have one. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, so we, again, we it sounds like that curiosity and openness and, and slowing down enough to notice sounds like central skills yeah. here. Yes, and also discipline ourselves to go against what we want to do sometimes by the knowledge and the awareness of this isn't going to be healthy. For instance, when I'm, if I'm really stressed, I'll go have a protein drink because I know that protein drink is going to do much more for me in a stressful state than a candy bar. <laughs> now I carry protein bars with me in between groups sometimes I'll have one because I know that that's going to be a natural craving and you have to teach yourself to go against what you feel like doing well how do I reduce the stress of course aerobic exercise coming home when you're stressed getting out of your head and into your body there's probably nothing that reduces stress more than aerobic exercise you know interval training even if it's for 20 minutes it makes a difference Beautiful. Thank you. That's lovely. I have one last question for you before we get to your, to your free gifts that you're offering. Because I know that many of the people on, uh, in our audience are healthcare professionals of various stripes or social work, psychologists, uh -huh. all of us um, also, uh, what's the word I want? People who work for, for social work organizations who are taking care of the disadvantaged in various ways. Yes. That exposes us to a lot of other people's trauma. And mm -hmm. the reason that I ask that is because you mentioned that you work with groups. And I imagine that you would hear many stories that if you, if you allowed them to sink into you, and if you're being open and empathic, it seems like they would, uh, that you then have to handle that kind of stress some way. I wonder if you can speak about that a little bit. I, th I think that when, we real when we're listening to someone who's troubled, if we're truly listening, that we're already doing something. Mm. And, and, and you know, I call it holy listening. You know, it it's, was a, a, a phrase coined by a, a, a theologian, Douglas Steer, and he said, 
Holy listening is listening another person's soul into a position of discovery, into a discovery, in, you know, in, and into learning about themselves. And when you, when you are able to do that, you, you are causing a brain change. So that's number one. If I'm listening and truly understanding you, in that moment, I'm causing a positive brain change. Secondly, we try to tease out the potential of people. That's part of our job in the helping professions. We don't look right at the moment. It's like somebody in grief who's lost someone or someone's died in their family or their spouse or, or horribly a child. You, you see what is in the moment and you're listening and you're trying to understand. You're not presuming. You're not trying to fix. You're trying to understand. And when you're doing that, you can also see the future that even though you're sobbing in my presence, I know that if I keep listening and keep providing you with understanding, that over time you're going to heal. So it's looking at a person not only for this moment, but you're, look, you're seeing some potential in the person that they can't see in themselves at that moment. And that gives us a sense of hope as caregivers. Wow. So pre being truly present, really listening, yes. and accessing that sense of hope as you see the potential in the other person. Yes. Yes. That, that kind of gives me little chills. I'm really liking that a lot. <laughs> Lovely. Can you talk a little bit about the, um, the empathy quotient and the stress survey that you're offering to our listeners? Well, the empathy quotient, it gives you a sense of, you know, your degree of empathy and ask some pertinent questions. Uh, and also the stress survey is important to take. If you do get the book, The Stress Solution, take it in the beginning and then see how you feel at the end. Because this book is really a workbook, and I, I have assignments at the end of each chapter, and I encourage you to share them with someone close to you. Uh -huh. and, and let me know through those questions who you're identifying in the, with in the stories I'm telling. But, you know, when we change, change is an active process, but we can't change that story from when we were younger, that early conditioning, to a more accurate story about ourselves without the help of others. We're all too subjective. So I'm asking people to have the courage to share with others. So share the result of those of those surveys. It's going to give you a sense of what level of stress you, you have at the moment. It's also a survey that you can take at different times, even in the week, to see where you see where you are. And the empathy quotient is even more important because I think it's 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 trying to get at the level of empathy that you have. And I think going through, you know, because empathy again is a discipline, it's like a muscle. If you don't practice it and think about practicing it every day in a disciplined way, it will atrophy. And empathy is a brain changer. Giving and receiving of empathy. Imagine, we're, we're changing our brains just by words. Or we're causing negative effects just by words. So, so, so brain chemistry becomes very important and we know that we can change it for the better if we're practicing this and paying attention to it. Those sound like really practical tools. I'm excited to check them out and to, to share them with someone close to me, my results, and see what that prompts in terms of conversation and true listening. Yes, well, I, I hope it's helpful to your listeners. Thank you. And thank you for your careful listening and your careful answers and for connecting it so beautifully to the science. I think we got a lot of great tips and a lot of understanding of the kind of underlying uh, physiology that, that causes us to respond well or poorly. Thank you very much. Well thank, well, thank you very much, Beth. You're very easy to interact with. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. All right. You have a great crossed, day. I think we produce some oxytocin. All right. <laughs> I will treasure it. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Bye-bye.